Um, some of you that came down to Delirium on Friday might be expecting me to do a talk on origami. Uh, this is a King Cobra model. Yes, it is one sheet of paper. One very long sheet of paper, albeit. But we're not talking about that. Um, I have something of a deep, dark secret. Um, I'm actually something of an awful person. By awful, I don't mean necessarily bad, although we can argue about that. I mean in the sense of an adult fan of Lego, A-F-O-L. In this case, uh, th this is obviously not my work, <laughs> thankfully, unfortunately. Um, well, it has been, uh, <laughs> this is a model that I found at random. Um, one problem that I have uh, living as I do as an expat overseas is most of my collection of bricks is in the U.S. as I cannot have them shipped over here. So instead of something on this scale, I'm kind of forced to work on a much smaller scale. I believe I'm, I believe I'm allowed to call that a laser sword. Thank you, Lucasfilm. So, a, a much smaller part count, much smaller. Now, when you are stuck far from home and need, and need, more, and need more sets or go to Bricklink, you need, a, lot, you need a, a little bit of creativity. You can't quite build on this scale. Uh, yes, that is a real live adult there. This is a model of St. Pancras Station in London, if you've been there. And yes, the trains going in and out do work. They in fact go all the way around the exhibit and back to the bridge that you see in back. This, I think, was taken at Lego World in London in 2015. I was lucky enough to be there. So a, a lot of pieces, a lot of piece count. And unfortunately, most people don't have that, don't have that many pieces. But luckily for us, we have substitutes. We have MLCAD, um, Lego CAD, Lego CAD design. This is, uh, admittedly, is an old application. I would prefer to use the term of venerable. The important thing that we need to worry about here are the three panes that are above. The one marked 14 over there is the, um, is a way to choose the piece. Frame 13 there talks about the type of piece, talks about the um, type of piece and more probably has the part ID. And down here in pane 12, you have the X, Y, and Z coordinates of pieces that you position. A MLCAD text file, much reduced, looks something like this. You have columns for X, Y, Z, a part name, and a color with a string, in this case, because some colors uh, have, there is the light gray, there is the dark gray, there is the old blue, there is the TARDIS blue, et cetera. So you have a, com so you have a combination of several different types of identifiers. So in, um, we'll start this out easy in Pearl 5. Um, how many of you here are working with or have played so far with Pearl 6? Okay, about, about half. All right, excellent, excellent. So may, you've probably seen some, so everyone here probably knows how braille expressions used to work. <laughs> I, 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 not, I shouldn't use that phrase. Uh, I, I will use the phrase how they work right now in Pearl 5. I, I work in Pearl 5 right now. Um, I am very much, oh, about uh, 25, 20 or so years of my career to Pearl 5, so I love it. I still use the language on a daily basis, but I'm using Pearl 6 now as more of, right now, a hobby, and eventually we will get people to the point where we have job descriptions for Pearl 6. But, <coughs> but that's the future. So, Everyone immediately knows what this expression is, just right off the bat. Almost. Most of you probably do. Most of you can probably read this very easily. For a new person coming in or anyone looking at Pearl 
five code, they're going to look at this and immediately say, what the blank? What is that? It's just a bunch of slashes and stars and plus signs. Nothing there to really tell what it is. And even if you know what it is, looking along there, you're not going to get an idea of what the file content you're parsing actually looks like. You're not going to get an idea of an X, Y, or Z coordinate. You're not going to get an idea of this being an identifier or a string. You're not going to get that. Even if you take the time to separate it out a little bit. And even then, if you look caref if you don't look carefully, you're not going to see the fact that you have a slash D, slash S, slash D, and then along the way trips you up with a slash W. So it's a little bit harder to read. It's a little bit harder to understand. Even if you take the time with the X modifier to space it out a little bit. So you see that you have three strings of decimals, a string of identifier characters, and a string of, and a quote string down there. If you space it out, you can see a little bit more. You don't have visual separation between the between slash D and the slash W down there. A little bit more work, but you still really don't know what you're looking at unless you have a side-by-side -side copy of your data file to compare that to. So you see that, yes, X, Y, and Z match this, this, and this. You can do that as well. That, that's perfectly fine. You, you match things that way. Add comments in. That's what the slash X is for. Open up expression a little bit more. Show more what's going on. But it's still not one-to-one. -one. It's still not uh, the ideal of self-documenting code. Some of you might, rem some of you might by now <coughs> be thinking of what was introduced in, I think, 516. Uh, the named match, like so. I, I don't, uh, how many of you here have used the name match so far? Okay, not many. Okay, about four or five in the audience have actually used that or know what that is. Uh, this is a name capture where you take a, where you take the string, say the slash D there, and assign a name to it. I'm deliberately using generic names here for a reason. We'll get at that later on. But this is how it can look in 518, more documentative. If you replace the number with, say, X, you'll get, you can get X, Y, and Z for your coordinates on that and have a better idea of what you're looking at. Um, I, had, I have forgotten actually about this uh, for um, roughly a few years until Damien reminded me of that at the uh, Pearl Conference in, 20, in uh, Amsterdam this year. I have forgotten completely about name captures in Pearl 5. They're not that well used feature. But in Pearl 6, uh, what we do is we've taken that syntax and simplified just a little bit. So the, the one of the things that you'll probably also want to know as well is how to actually capture uh, content. How do you read that? In this case, um, I'm assuming that we're using the cap E flag where you have say for that feature, and you use the slash, use dollar plus. Obvious, completely blindly intuitive to the two people that have used the at plus variable in Perl <laughs> and the at minus that tells you the range of, of matches. It is intuitive once you know what those, once you know that it relates to the at plus variable. Completely intuitive. Perl 6, we're doing away with a lot of that, but we're leaving behind kind of a ghost, if you will, of the name capture. First thing we'll do is we'll use the module that I created and we'll get rid of the description of the slash D. Now, what this gives us as well as just the backslash, as just a string of digits, it gives us anything that Perl thinks, Perl 6 thinks is a number in there. So, if someone came along and used a half brick jumper in your design to go from 1 to 1 
now you're covered. If you have something like a star story that you need, that you need to use um, exponential numbers for, then by all means, we've got that covered. We've got negative size, we've got complex numbers covered if you want to, um, if you have, say, a four-dimensional or TARDIS or a real-life TARDIS and go back in time, we can use complex numbers to represent points if you really want to go that far. Um, I'm also deliberately using the quote notation number here uh, to avoid uh, complicating things for those people coming in from more of a Pro 5 mindset. The next thing we'll do to slim, to slim this down is get rid of those pesky parentheses. In Perl 6, these captures are automatically named for us. You don't need any fancy notation. So they're named like that. The last thing that we're going to want to do here is just one small change. You'll notice on the last slide, I'm going to use saying slash carrot blah 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 slash slash carrot blah 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 slash and then a plus to match. That's a little bit um, a little bit off-putting. It doesn't quite match with what you actually see there in the Perl code. There's no real mnemonic there. You would have to know again about the special variable add plus to know that it is a capture variable. So what we do in Perl 6 is you have slash slash, we use dollar slash. Much simpler. So the, the, the next thing that you might that we have in that string. We have the side from the identifier. We had a string there in quotes. Now, uh, the expression I show you there isn't quite, wouldn't quite work in Perl 6. Um, but in this case, um, the regex, the, pardon me, grammar common module gives you a string to work with. So we take the string, we capture the, uh, we capture the string. And you'll notice here that it comes back with the entire string, along with the outside quotation marks. This isn't a problem in most languages, in, in like uh, in JSON or C or C++ or Java. They don't really care about whether a string is in double or single quotes or is in QQ quotation marks. In Perl, we care a little bit more about that. So, looking at this, you might be thinking, great, I've got this string here as a blob, so now I've got to go back and figure out, A, what kind of string I'm starting with. Is it a QQ? Is it a double quote? Is it a single quote? And then match, strip off that in, strip off the back end matching, and then do some more work. Well, luckily for us, Perl 6 supports not only regular captures, name captures, but nested name captures, like so. So we have a, your string and look inside to match the content directly. And the uh, grammar common module, when it's finally released, uh, will have an alias for that, so you have to type both layers in to match that. It'll just be like string dash content in the final option as well. But you still get at the first and final quotation marks if you need that for parsing, say, another language that uses QQ with several, like maybe uh, Perl. One of those. So, so real expressions are both, so real expressions are, you can have name matches. You can still use the old parentheses. You can still use dollar one, dollar two, dollar three, et cetera, like you did before. Although, like we simplified, the plus to slash, we simplified and got rid of dollar zero. So now your matches all start at zero. Instead of having to remember that, oh yeah, because it is a match, you use one to do, use one, two, three, four for parentheses. Now you use dollar zero, one, two, three. Like every good programmer should start at zero. You might wonder how we would, if you have a lot of these values, say we have our x, y, and z numbers, you'll wonder how we separate those. It's easy. You add an alias, like so. 
with with color with um, color equal, you give that a function. You give that a name, and you reference it by the original name of string or by the color. And you still pull in the content variable because it's still alias in that fashion. Simpler. So variable expressions are you can capture them, you can nest them. And if you and of course, like we said before, you have x you have you have your name variables for name, x, name, y, et cetera, and still print things out. This would almost work in this would almost work out in Perl 5 as well. Just change the plus signs there and put back all the noise. And there's also a notation to do at least to just use the X or Y for the name capture. And also you'll notice as well, the original string we have backslash D with no minus sign. Now that we're using an actual number, we can go and use any type of number that we want. So when we find out later on that the file format has changed, or we find out that, oh yeah, I forgot to add scientific notation to that, you're covered. With one module and one term, you're covered for all of that. So like the negative three, four in this case. Now, we're gonna get a little bit more complex, a, a little bit more in depth. Uh, th this is a um, Lego ball contraption made by a fellow by the name of Akiyuki. His entire goal is to move uh, balls from the left-hand side of the screen through these whirling things up to the top level of the black structure and then back down. It's part of a long chain of things and the world record uh, was set recently in 2018 for roughly, I think it was um, almost half a football field of these machines considerably passing balls from one to another. Terrific clanking noise, lots of fun to go watch. If you need noise distraction, I highly recommend looking for a Lego GBC, great ball contraption video online, if you need the distraction. Now, we, we were talking back about uh, MLCAD and how to work with, with Lego. Uh, this is kind of more my speed. The thing is that, again, as a programmer, what I would want to do is, instead of sitting in hand and by hand, taking one of these structures, copy, turn, paste, copy, <coughs> turn, paste, like so, all the time, what I want to do is do that obviously in Perl. So we have here um, alternating red and yellow stages as we go along the structure. Each one twists it just a little bit, move it up, twist, move up, twist, move up, twist, like so. That is ideally suited to automation. So what would, what would, what would we want to do? Let's instead of worrying about all of the looping constructs, let's just look at something simple like this. You have a MLCAD file now that this time has a variable in it, and you do math. We have the layer, which will be the stack as you go up. So each time you go up one, put on your red, go up one, put on your yellow, and then repeat that way. We'll worry about rotation later on, don't worry. Well, we'll get to that stage. But again, we have, we have a file, simple file. And, but we have these terms here now for two times layer, two times layer plus one. How would we go ahead and, par and throw that into our Perl 6 parser? Well, again, it's pretty easy to do. You have a number. Uh, you need to use double quotes, you need to use some sort of quotes around the star there because Perl 6 simplifies all of those rules about backslashes and gets rid of all of that noise. All you need to know is if it is outside of the, if it is not a letter, then it needs to be backslashed. Not, a, I'm sorry, not a letter or a meta character. It needs to be backslashed. 
So that way the slash at, so the plus over here um, doesn't fall on that rule because that's a minute character. So you can do things in this fashion and, and match that way. So you have number star ident. But then you have to do a whole bunch of number star ident, number plus ident, number minus ident, etc. You have to go through, do all those choices, and maybe get something wrong, and then forget that you forgot to add in number plus number, number minus number, because someone may try to play around that format that way. So what you would so what we would do here is because we're good programmers and want to refactor, we would take our number plus number, number times number, etc., and group it into a row expression, like so. So this is how we create our own tags. You don't have to rely just on my module to get the number or get a string. You can create your own, like so, and it's just that easy. You, you say my regex and then regex name, Follow up and use it just like you would use anything else. The expert here. And later on, you can say expert number because we can nest expressions. That includes expressions that you create. Those all get nested. So you say dollar slash brace expert expert number. So the expert, so the number inside the expression and the identifier inside expression is done that way. But what we want to do there again is go one level further and why don't we just sort of hide that away? So we'll just, so we'll just change a little bit of that. This time now we're using my module and this time what you do on your side is you create the value term over here, which is a generic, either a number or an identifier, say an, a C identifier or a Perl identifier. By default, it will, by default, it'll be Perl, but for demonstration's sake, we'll say C. You take your expression, you take the expression tag and drop it right into your expression. Slash, carrot, and then expression and parse, go on with life. And this will handle, this will handle number plus number, number minus number, number times number. But also because Perl expression, Perl six expressions are recursive, it can handle number times number plus number, number times parent to number plus number, close parent, and so on down nesting. This, if you have tried, if you worked with any uh, natural language parsing or parsing of, say, C, this is where people tend to get tripped up when they start writing expressions. They will go through and write a expression that exactly matches what they need, and then someone comes along and writes, you know, 2 plus A, or A plus 2, turns around the order, and your parser breaks. With this, you don't need to worry. You drop in the expression replacement, and you have the entire match tree available it will handle all standard C type expressions, all standard Perl type expressions, if you choose. And you get back the um, you get back an actual the original text along with the full nesting, as well. We se I separate inside there. I use uh, terms to separate things, so I won't go too deep into the into the layers. But it lets you handle constructs like these. Um, yes, pi over layer, so pi over one, pi over two is is not quite the right calculation, but is but the real calculation will not fit on the screen. I thought about it for about 15 minutes, and I can't get it to quite fit on the screen, so we'll have have to make do with this. But it will do the cal it will do this calculation for you. Sight unseen, you don't need to worry about anything. It drops in. It's a straightforward replacement, and you don't need to go in and try to figure out how to match parentheses. You don't need to worry about how to do star, how to do times. You don't need to worry about, okay, is slash parse before star 
you know, star parts before, right ship. You don't need to worry about any of that. The grammar model takes care of that for you. The, the last thing before we get into, before we move into the bonus round here, um, is, is we're going is um, how to do options for right expressions, because we've already talked about how they are, how they are as powerful at least as Perl five, how they can be nested, how they are recursive, usually recursive, uh, expression matches on itself. In fact, and that you will find hard, um, you'll find hard to that hard to do with uh, languages such as um, Bison or Flex or Yak. Those, while they work out, you can take a while to figure out how that works. But again, with a grammar common module, those problems are all gone. There's one little quirk here. Uh, the seven point here. Um, some languages like a trailing, like to have, sorry, like to require a trailing zero, like a um, trailing number like 1.2, the point two trailing. They like that for the point point numbers. Some will take uh, 0.35. Some don't like 7.1, so or just bare 7 point like Perl does, Perl 6 does. So one of the things that you'll want to do with your regular expression is, is you know, you can choose, you can make, you know, two or three expressions and put them into your grammar. And that will clear up your namespace. You'll have, you may have problems down the road. Trying, trying to figure out just what, go, what goes where. You clear namespaces. So one thing that you can do with your regular expressions is remember that in Perl 6, real expressions are also functions that you pass in arguments to. So if you want to, so if you want to disallow the, so if you want to disallow the bare trillion decimals, so if you want to make seven point illegal, because you only want 7.1, 7.2, you take your expression, your real expression, and pass in this value. One second. Okay. All right. Luckily, we've got just enough time to go into our bonus round. You yeah, party on. Okay. So, uh, the, the last thing that I promised in the talk, luckily, we can cover a little bit of this. Um, and this, and for this, uh, if there are questions, and right, if there are questions coming up, I will take them as they come, because we need to go a little bit slower on this step. So I mean, everyone can keep, everyone can keep up. The first thing that we want to do is get rid of a little bit more clutter in our expression, because we have all this white space here. We have the slash s plus, and then if you want to use like. If you want to make the optional slash s star, we want to make that all. Op we want to make that optional. In Perl six, we just want to make it go away. Instead of using the regex, we use the rule designation, and then every term that you have, say the x equal number, y equal number, string, gets optional white space automatically. You can overwrite, of course, if you want. But this just makes things a lot simpler, a lot shorter. You don't have to worry. Did I remember to put white space between the, the, the X and Y? Did I remember between the plus and the star? Where do we go with the braces? Do we want a new line after that? The rule takes care of all that for you. So that, trim, so that trims down your code, means you have less work, less middle work to process. Less work for you to do in the code. And in this case, like the regex, it's just another construct that you drop into your own code. You'll be able to drop in a parser for a line. And by the way, when I say parser, just to clarify this, uh, I truly mean an actual parser because these are both regexes and they're also the same language that Perl 6 uses to parse itself. 
So, so when you have an expression that you match, you can actually parse a Perl 6 expression. One of the famous things that we, use, that we like to say about Perl 5 is only Perl 5 can parse Perl 5. The nice thing about Perl 6 is it's parsed in Perl 6. It, it's not quite the same thing because you can take the Perl 6 regex extension and re-implement that in C, re-implement that in, say, JavaScript, which has already been done, and take that regex extension and move it anywhere else and put your compiler onto any platform you want. LLVM, CLang, JVM, anything that, anything that you can take and support a run expression engine from Perl. Anything that you can do that with. So Perl 6 can move to any platform that we want. Now, we, we have these, uh, we have our line here. We're going to go just a little bit further here and take this line and our expressions and package them up into, mm, into a neat little package that we can move around to the MLCAD grammar. So we take that MLCAD parser, which truly is a parser, much like, what, much like the uh, last talk, and move that around. And this time we have one more term. Uh, a grammar here, uh, for those of you from the Perl 5 community, is basically a package with um, mousse and special sauce. So we, we have, so, there are proper well, there are proper attributes. It does compositions, and more importantly, just like Moose, it does roles, which is what Grammar Common is. It's a role that you drop into anything. So you can take that and use it for whatever you like. You can add that into your own parsers. You can go in and just copy out bits of code if you like. You can go in and add that to your own parser, subclass that into whatever you like. So that so that's what a grammar is. It is just a fancy name for a class that has only rules and regexes. There's one on type, but we won't get into that right now. The important rule that you need to know for a grammar is the rule named top. Oh, T-O-P, all caps. That's how Perl 6 knows when, where to start parsing. So when we take our string, 10 space 20 space, and then two times layer plus one, when we take that, that's where Perl knows where to apply the parse. It knows to start looking for the expression and label it X, followed by another expression, label Y, et cetera, and so on. We change, of course, the uh, slashes are, these slashes are now the parse expression. And, of course, we can go in and take a look at anything, any of the uh, objects. I'm not going to show you the parse tree for this because it is a bit ugly. But, again, the mnemonic holes, we have been using slashes all along, and now we still use the slash for af after the parse or copy or capture the value into a variable. I don't have quite enough room on the screen to fit that. And again, uh, we, and again we have two, time, again we have a complex expression and regular numbers and all of that fun stuff. Okay, so I'm a little bit of, I'm a little bit have time here, um, and I do apologize because we are down to the last slide uh, for this. So if you have questions, now was the time. Um, so for the last thing, one of the things that I promised in the talk, and we are delivering, is a is a actual interpreter. Because one of the things that we give you, I give you alongside of the actual parser, is you get a just-in-time interpreter for your language. So when you have your expression, as long as long as only uses pure math, this will handle pure math just fine. If 
if you try to add a string to a number, you'll get an odd result, just like you would in, say, C. Yeah. So this, this becomes effectively a dropping, and this becomes a dropping interpreter. So if you want to do, if you want to take your program, read out a file, and do just-in-time interpretation, maybe just fill in a few things. This is a sim this is a simple way to do that. It it truly it I design things to be as, as simple as possible for this. So you take you literally take the module that you have here and drop that in and run. You can use the basic you can use basic stuff like numbers, identifiers. The numbers all come from Perl. The identifier terms all again come from either Perl or they are configurable for C or C++ values as well. So I, I by no means, you know, I, I by no means fixate on Perl for this because the world's more complex. The strings that we have here, strings like these will take, you can use that for say parsing JSON, you can use that for parsing YAML, you can use that for just raw identifier content, like and so on. The expressions that you get over here for such things as two times later, uh, there's also a prefix and postfix. So if you so if fourth so fourth of you speak, then we've got you covered on that. So you so you can do uh, we can do postfix expressions, infix and prefix as well. Those were all covered. And I am running a bit down here. So if there are no question if there are questions out here as to uh, where why would you want to use this? Um, why would anyone want to use this? Um, the first thing that obviously comes to mind is doing say syntax highlighting for languages. Write your own highlighter. Write your own reformat utility. Uh, one of the things that you can use this in uh, com in uh, combination with is another of my uh, modules, um, Perl Assist Antler, which takes a grammar for a language. Yeah, which takes a grammar for a language and um, like say C and turns it into Perl. So you have a Perl compiler, and you use my tools to fill in the file bits that you want.